Okay, we're going to get started. This is our second week on uh, the Bible study concerning the Sabbath. This particular Bible study is entitled The Sabbath Day and verses that seem to contradict the Sabbath. We want to encourage um, all of you who have not um, had the opportunity to uh, look at the first Bible study on the Sabbath to do so. And uh, it'll make this particular Bible study a lot clearer when you understand the basic uh, fundamentals of the Sabbath. And in, in the last Bible study, we talked about the Sabbath day, what day is the Sabbath day, and what the Sabbath day memorializes. So this is part two um, of this particular uh, Bible study, and I believe we're going to have one more week. Um, and we are going to show on, on next week how to observe the Sabbath. So we have a lot of information to cover on today, Elder Ivory. Uh, is joining me today, um, again, as he is each and every week. So we're going to go through. We have about 36, 37 slides, and um, we want to just get started uh, right away. No part of this publication may be reproduced or retransmitted without the express written consent of Bethel Temple, Inc. of Chicago, which is under the leadership of Chief Apostle Dr. Yeho Kanabi Aman. The information that you are about to be presented is not independent of Bethel Temple, Inc. of Chicago, or Dr. Aman, who through revelational research, which includes biblical hermeneutics, has discovered the ancient biblical principles that were once kept by the prophets of old and later by Christ in the New Testament. These same principles were taught to the disciples by the Messiah, who then commanded them to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Uh, we still have our Bible study set up in two parts. As you know, lecture is in the part one. All the participants are going to be muted, and then we open up at the end, part two, for questions and answers. Um, as you do every week, star six on your keypad or star six on your phone. We have a number of different goals here that we want to um, reach today. The first goal is to erase the feelings of doubt associated with explaining biblical passages of the Old and New Testament that seem to contradict Sabbath keeping. We want to explain how Yahshua, which is Jesus, and other chosen leaders of the Bible made an open show of the, trend, of the traditions and philosophies of men by pointing out the differences between the commandments of men and the commandments of El, which is God. And finally, um, we want to provide believers with a rationale for witnessing the Sabbath correctly. So when you understand these seemingly contradicting Bible verses, it will help you uh, gain a better understanding um, of the attacks that individuals are going to receive when they teach the Sabbath or talk about the Sabbath. And it is our goal today to give you the uh, adequate uh, information that you can rebuttal these uh, people who go against the Sabbath using these seemingly contradicting Bible verses. So this is a little bit of a review of the first slide, and we talked about this last week. And uh, we want to just sum it up on this one slide, the everlasting nature of the Sabbath day from the Old and New Testament. So we just have a couple of different Bible verses where um, we show that it is an everlasting covenant from both the Old and the New Testament. And we're going to go through these. We don't want to spend a lot of time on these because we went over these last week in depth. In the book of Exodus, the 31st chapter, verse 13, uh, 16 and 17, it says, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual, that's a key word, for a perpetual covenant. That means everlasting, um, infinity. It doesn't end. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Um, in the book of Isaiah, uh, I didn't get the verse here, book of Isaiah, the 66th chapter, um, we talked about this for a while last week. It says, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me. So he said, I will make. The new heavens and the new earth does not exist yet. It says, says the Jehovah, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, said the Jehovah. So in the new heaven and the new earth, 
we are still going to observe the Sabbath day. And finally, in the book of Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 16 through 22, it says, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So the question is, what shall I do to obtain eternal life? And to, what should I do to get into the kingdom of heaven? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is El. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And we know that the Sabbath day is part of the commandments. Now, if, if I can just sum this up really quick, because as we go through these verses that seem to contradict the Sabbath, you're going to have to keep these three verses in mind. And to sum them up again, they are saying that the Sabbath is an everlasting or perpetual covenant. Okay, and since it's a perpetual covenant, that means that when you get to the new heavens and the new earth, you're going to go before him and keep the Sabbath and the new moon, all flesh, not just Israel. We know it said Israel up here in the verse, but all flesh. If you plan to see him in the kingdom, all flesh is going to keep the Sabbath. Now, it's important that we not only give you Old Testament verses, but New Testament verses. And the New Testament said, that if you want to enter into life, and I know many of you out there plan to enter into life. Well, he told you keep the commandments. And if you read the other verses, it'll give you an idea which ones he's talking about. Because the man asked him, said, well, which one? All these I kept from my youth up. And he gave him a sample of the commandments, which is what we know as the Ten Commandments. So the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments. So what good thing can you do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments or keep the Sabbath with the commandments. Okay, and when we do that, if you will be perfect, do that and you can be perfect. All right, man. That's what we must keep in mind. Okay. So let's get into this, uh, Elder. If the Sabbath covenant is still binding, how do you explain uh, Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 13 through 15? That's all right. Now, uh, before we read Isaiah, let's just look at the, the, uh, the words up at the top. The Old Testament is full of examples where many Jewish sects, now a sect is what we call a denomination today. And those denominations began to substitute their own traditions in place of the commandments of El. Now, at those times that they were doing those things, El spoke against their evil ways. And those individuals today now that lack a good working knowledge of the Old Testament, when they read it, they automatically conclude, oh, this is El doing away with his Sabbath. What we want to show you today is El does away with the Sabbath. Why? Because it's a perpetual covenant, because it's going to be kept in the new heaven and new earth, and because Mashiach, that is Christ himself, said if you want to enter into life, you keep the commandments. So when you read Isaiah 1, 13 through 15, it says, bring no more vain oblations. First word that should jump out at you is the word vain. Anything that is vain does not accomplish what you set out to accomplish. Increase, incense, excuse me, is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Now, why do you think El would call the Sabbath and the new moon iniquity? We're going to soon find out. Even the solemn meeting he's saying is iniquity. But now some key words are being used. It says, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. Now, I want you to clearly understand he's not talking about his. He made the point clear in this verse, your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hate. So we're going to find out later on how can the Sabbath become yours? How can the new moon and the solemn feast become yours? Okay, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. If you ever think about it, and I'm going to get off of this quick, in the New Testament, there's going to be people that come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? This is one of the very reasons why. Because they're your Sabbaths. They're your moon, new moon because you're keeping them in the way that you design and not the way that he designed for you to keep them. And that's what we're going to find out from this verse. 
Beautiful elder, and we have to uh, keep in mind, as elder said, remember that these are seemingly contradicting Bible verses. These are some of the Bible verses that individuals will use uh, to go against the Sabbath day. And so we want you to keep in mind, because we're going to revisit this Bible verse and, and one similar to it when it says your new moons and your appointed feast days. And so um, we want you to hold on to that. Don't let people trick you and fool you and say, well, the Sabbath day is no longer binding. Look at what uh, Isaiah said uh, in Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 13 through 15. So keep that in mind um, as we move forward. We're going to go back, Elder, and we're going to revisit this Bible verse again. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Many Sabbath keepers, they spend a lot of time explaining how Constantine, emperor of Rome, played a significant role in the change of the Sabbath day from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. And Elder, we We've done it in the past, and uh, you will talk to a number of people who talk about the Sabbath being transferred from the seventh day to the first day in 325 A.D. But we're going to see that well before Constantine, there was a change in the Sabbath. But they give little to no time pointing out the significant role played by non-believing Jews in esteeming their religious practices above the word of truth. That's another thing, Elder, we're going to concentrate on. Uh, that phrase non-believing Jews because uh, most people who read the Bible they only know of one kind of Jew when you, they see the word Jew or Jewish or Israel they lump them all together in, in one category but we're talking specifically here about non-believing Jews it wasn't long after the Sabbath commandment had been given that the seeds of change began to appear by merely reading the entire chapter of verses surrounding the verses in question it's easy to see how the Jew influenced the Sabbath and made changes through their wickedness. In his vision, Isaiah described how these festivals belong to the Jews who observed them incorrectly and in unrighteousness. So uh, we have a lot here, Elder. If you want to highlight some key uh, points here in Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 1 through 8, and uh, yes. we're going to see how it relates to what we're talking about. Now, I want to, I want to highlight them. But I want to make a statement before I do. Okay. Do not allow people to give you one verse in isolation and read it to you, and then you sit there and try to twiddle your thumbs and figure out what it's saying. Read the verses above it. Read the verses below it so you can get the full concept. Now, if you go to the first verse of the first chapter of Isaiah, you can get the idea of what's going on. First of all, it's the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And these were kings of Judah. So he saw this over a span of time. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Here's the idea. Let's look at the red part. It says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. If you ask yourself the question, who's speaking? Now, we know that Isaiah is given the vision, but Isaiah is given the word of Jehovah. That's the Lord, as, as he sees it in his vision. It says, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people does not consider. Now, here's the most important part, and it's in bold red. Our sinful nation. Now, these people had begun to sin. A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. Now, we can stop right there. So when you're reading Isaiah, the first chapter, verses 13 through 15, in isolation, you don't see this. But when you go back, you'll see that we're talking about people who are evildoers and corruptors. Right. And so if they are, what do you think they did with the Sabbath and the new moon? They corrupted it. Mm -hmm. And that's why El said your solemn feasts, your Sabbaths, and your new moons. So they took it and observed it the way they wanted to, reserve, to observe it, and he, he punished them for what they did. So learn how to read above and below whatever question that you have that's being uh, questioned. Okay, great. Um, and as we see in the example, we can use an example, uh, Elder, when people say um, – the Americans did, you know, the Americans fought in a war overseas. Well, did all the people of America fight? No, they're talking about 
a uh, specific group within America. So That's the same right. thing applies here when we look at the Bible. When the Bible talks about Israel, <clears throat> and you hear me say this probably every other uh, Bible study, when it talks about Israel or Yisrael or Jew in the negative light, it's talking about the seed of evildoers. When it talks about Yisrael, because, uh, Elder, we know that the Bible seems to contradict itself when it talks about the people of Israel or, or the Jews. Well, there were those that were uh, of a righteous seed, and there was those that were unrighteous. So um, it's important to keep that in mind. But we want to move on and uh, ask this question here, Elder. If the Sabbath covenant is still binding, how do you explain Hosea, the second chapter, verse 11 and 12 below? Okay. Uh, let me just, I'll let you read that verse. I want to read this caption up here. It says, in a uh, manner similar to that used by Isaiah, Hosea uses the personal pronoun. When we talk about personal pronoun, we're talking about here the word her. So he uses the word her instead of yours. But the idea is the same. It's the same. I'm not talking about my feast. I'm talking about her feast. Okay. To indicate that the Sabbath and new moon festivals belong to the Jews, those that were wicked and doing the wrong things. It is certain that El did not abolish his Sabbath. Why? Because we said earlier it's everlasting. It's going to be kept in the new heaven and the new earth. You, if you want to uh, uh, be perfect, if you want to uh, receive eternal life, keep the commandments. So he's not talking about his Sabbath. So why don't you tell us what that says, Minister? Sure. Hosea, the second chapter, verse 11 uh, through 12 is just like we read in Isaiah. It says, I will also call all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a force, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And so we see, uh, Elder, just like we've seen in Isaiah, this is not talking about El's feast days. Now, was it the children of Israel that were keeping these? Yes. But the children of Israel, there were two different kinds. Were these the Jews that were keeping this? Yes. But remember, there were two right. different kinds of Jews. And, and let me just go back for a minute. Remember it said all of sinful nations. Somebody said, I got you there on my everybody in Israel. But remember what we also read? This is talking about over a period of time, over a period of kings that reigned at a particular time. And so when we talk about these people then, we're talking about the, the nation of people, but the nation of people that were wicked. Not all the people. Because when I talk about those that were righteous, I'm talking about the nation of people who were righteous. Right. Okay. If the Sabbath covenant is still binding, how do you explain Amos, the fifth chapter, uh, verse 21 to 23? And I'll go ahead and read this, Elder, if you want to um, address the, the information on the left. Amos, the fifth chapter, verse 21 uh, through 23 says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. That's all right. Now, we have a pattern here, and this pattern is being shown. It was shown in the book of Isaiah. It's shown in the book of Hosea. And I want to invite each one of you, when you go back home or when, when you uh, actually have time, look at the entire chapter, and you can put all of these uh, verses in perspective. Now, if you ask yourself the question, why would El hate and defy, despise a festival that he instituted? It just doesn't make sense. He, he instituted it, he started, and then he said, I hate it. I mean, that sounds a little bit crazy, especially after he said it's a perpetual covenant. Right. Now, what we're saying here is either you're saying that El is senile and he's forgetful. He forgot he established the Sabbath, and now he said, I hate it. Or El didn't destroy his Sabbath. He destroyed somebody else's Sabbath. Did you know you can have a Sabbath? Right. Take the Sabbath day and don't do it the way El told you to do it. And it becomes yours. Right. And this is what he's destroying. He's destroying the way that these Jews 
uh, celebrated it. And that's why we find the key word in Isaiah, your feast. The key word in the book of Hosea, her feast. And the key word in Isaiah, your feast. So this is a pattern throughout the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, you may not see that pattern, but I want you to remember the pattern so when you get to the New Testament, you'll keep the understanding that you develop in the Old Testament. So uh, like one of the previous uh, passages, the personal pronoun your was used to identify exactly whose feasts were being hated. El hate, hated the Jews' feasts that were wicked, not his, mm-hmm. not the feasts of the Jews that were walking upright, but those that walked wickedly. And you'll see that if you read the entire chapter of Amos, the okay. fifth chapter. Okay. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In each Old Testament example where the Sabbath, the new moon, and other biblical festivals were disdained and destroyed by El, the piece of the puzzle can be used as evidence to conclude that El does not break his covenants. Therefore, the commandment of men and wickedness are both involved. And we read these Bible verses, in, especially in Psalms uh, eighty-nine thirty-four, where he says, My covenants will I not break. Uh, you said it a few slides ago, Elder. In the Old Testament, as um, in, in the book of Exodus, as well as the book of Isaiah, we see that the Sabbath day was given as a perpetual covenant. And we see that the Sabbath day is kept in the new heaven and the new earth. So if we just hold on to those two Bible verses, if we can just hold on to those two, when we see Bible verses that says something different than Exodus and Isaiah, then it, it's talking about something entirely different. And people don't see that uh, when they read these Bible verses. But, Elder, if you can read um, Amos 8 and 5, and as well as Amos, we can go over a little bit of Amos, the fifth chapter. We don't have to read all six verses. But okay. uh, we can talk uh, about that. Well, we have some people here that, that have the same general idea. It says, saying, when will the new moon be gone? Now, this is somebody who wants the new moon to be over soon. And the reason is given. And it says that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry, that we may sell corn. Now, they're valuing the selling of corn more than celebrating the new moon. All right, and the Sabbath. So when will the Sabbath be over? That we may set forth wheat. They want to sell more than they want to keep the feast days. If you look at the latter part, it says, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. So these, again, are wicked people. And when you find people that are wicked, and you see the L talking about the Sabbath, and destroying the Sabbath, he's destroying the Sabbath the way that they keep it, not the way that he designed it. So it's not his Sabbath, it's their Sabbath. And the same thing goes today. You want to keep the first day of the week and call that the Sabbath, it becomes your Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And guess what he's going to do to you? The same pattern that spits in this New Old Testament will fit you today. Okay. And, and so Amos, the fifth chapter, is giving us pretty much the same thing. It says the version of, of Israel is fallen. So if you're fallen, that means you're not up. You're not righteous. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. She shall no more rise. Is it talking about all Israel? No. It's talking about the version of Israel. She, it, she is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. So when you read the rest of this verse, you'll find out that wickedness was abounding. And therefore, when you read about the Sabbath or anything else that pertains to feast days, the elder point, these feast days belong to those people and not to El. And it's the pattern that's set here in the Old Testament. Right. Okay. And you guys can go back and and look over these. We have a number of different... uh, um, a lot of information we want to get through um, within an hour. So I'm going to move relatively quickly on some of these long verses. If the Sabbath covenant is still binding, how do you explain Lamentations, the second chapter, verse 6, and Ezekiel, the, 20, the 20th chapter, verse 13? Well, let's just make it really quick. Look at the words. But the house of Israel rebelled, so they're evil, they're wicked. Just skim down there, you'll see. And they despised my judgment, so they didn't want his commandments. They were evil. My Sabbaths, they greatly polluted. So the same pattern is taking place. 
And then he gives them a warning. But if ye will not, if we're in Lamentations 2 and 6, if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath, so evidently they weren't, why give them a warning if they're doing it? And not to bear a burden. Okay, so these, again, are people who were not keeping the Sabbath and the new moon, and therefore El despised their festivals and wants to destroy them. Okay, and I hope everybody is getting this pattern and seeing the pattern of uh, wicked Yisrael. And uh, we have to be careful of not letting people apply that to true Yisrael. Teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. The consequences for breaking the Sabbath commandment are consistent throughout the Bible. For the wages of sin is death. And um, in the first John, the third chapter, verse four, it tells us whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So we know that transgression of the law means to not keep or to go against the law. And we know that the Sabbath day was part of the law. So if we don't keep the Sabbath day, then we're committing sin. In the book of Romans, New Testament, ver, uh, chapter 6, verse 23, it says the same thing. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of El is eternal life through Yahshua Meshachah, our Lord, which is Jesus Christ. And lastly, in the book of James, uh, the second chapter, verse 10, uh, I don't know, Elder, people read the, this particular verse, but I, for some reason they miss it. It says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you say that the Sabbath day, which is a part of the law, is done away with, or if you profane the Sabbath day, then you're guilty of all of them. So we must keep all the commandments. That's all right. Were the traditions of men uh, as problematic el elder in the New Testament as they were in the Old Testament? Yes, they were. And, and here's the point, and that's why we went with the Old Testament first. Because if you understand the pattern in the Old Testament, it becomes easy to follow the pattern in the New Testament. So because the traditions of men develop simultaneously alongside of the word of El, those people who were new converts, they had a real rough time trying to distinguish between the commandments of men and the commandments of El. Because way back there in the Old Testament, they did their own thing. Now, so the problem escalated so much that the Bible tells us in Matthew 23 and 13 that they shut heaven. How did they do it? With their traditions. They taught their traditions in place of the word of El, and people believed it, and to those people they sh shut the kingdom of heaven. So it says in Matthew 23, 13, I won't read it all, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. People are actually going in, and you stopping them with your traditions. Mark seven thirteen says, making the word of El, that is God, of none effect. How? Through your traditions. So if I can get you to follow some tradition that's not what El set up, I can keep you out of heaven. So effectively, I shut heaven on you. And finally, Matthew 15 and 6, thus have ye made the commandments of El, the commandments of God, of non-effect by your tradition. That's probably a new concept to you. You didn't think that you can shut the kingdom of heaven by having false doctrine. Right. And if you follow it, heaven is shut to you. Okay. And I think we can't uh, explain that or say that uh, enough times that, you know, people say, well, it, it's up to me whether I get into heaven. Yeah, it's up to you, but it's up to who you follow. I mean, if you're following behind a person or if a person is teaching you that the Sabbath is no longer binding, if you're teaching yourself that the Sabbath is no longer binding, it is this information, it, it's these traditions. You know, whenever you do anything that's contrary to what El says we must do, then it's called the tradition of men. And you are shutting right. up the kingdom of heaven to yourself. If the Sabbath day is binding today, how do you explain the fact that Yahshua, which is Jesus, and his disciples broke the Sabbath? Now, this is a, we're going to start getting into something juicy here, Elder, because people say that he broke the Sabbath day. So how do we explain that? 
And you know what? I want to go beyond that. I want to go right along with the people. Not only do they say it, the Bible said he broke the Sabbath. Mm. So, and we can't get around that. He broke the Sabbath. That's what well, the Bible said. Let's investigate to find out how he broke the Sabbath and under what circumstances. Okay. Now, um, so during the New Testament era, what we're trying to point out is that the traditions of the elders, they had managed to gain a strong grasp on believers. So those that believed, they, it, they had the traditions of the elders so strong in them, they couldn't tell the difference between the word of El and the traditions of men. Now, this grip was so strong that it became literally impossible for believers to distinguish between the two. Now, anyone who failed to recognize the pattern of infiltration of Jewish traditions from the Old Testament, now, you're certainly going to miss it when it comes to the New Testament, and that's why we started there first. For it is business as usual for those false Jews. With the exception now, when you come to the New Testament, guess what? They had somebody else they could pick on, and that was Yahshua, whom we call Jesus, and his disciples. Mm -hmm. And we can look at John the fifth chapter. Would you read that for us? Sure. John the fifth chapter, verse 18 says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, uh, what I want to invite people to do is when we read these verses, it, we are ask you all the time, ask yourself three questions. Who's talking? Who are they talking to? And what are they talking about? Now, John is recording this. But the point is you want to point out who said it. So mm -hmm. it said the Jews sought to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath. Now, he's reporting something that was said. And right here is not quite telling you who said it. But say also that God was his father. Now we get a better understanding. The Jews are accusing him of not only breaking the Sabbath, but saying that God was his father. And guess what? That made himself equal with God. People will tell you all the time, Jesus never said that I'm God. Well, maybe you don't understand his language. You don't understand old English. Okay, or you don't understand Hebrew. But these people back then understood that he was saying that I and my father are one. If he's God, I'm God. Right. That's what he was saying. Right. Now, so throughout here, and let me just read this last portion because we're going, uh, we need, our time is going past. It says, why do they, let me read that, 24, and the Pharisees said, so now we know who said it, unto him, why mm -hmm. do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? So they're accusing not only uh Yasha himself of breaking the Sabbath, but now they're accusing his disciples of breaking the Sabbath. Who's doing the, uh, making the accusations? The Jews are, the Pharisees in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and Elder, we're going to see that. Uh, and and I, I wanted to be clear to people because I don't know if everybody fully understands how the Jews incorporate their traditions and, and we're going to see in the book of Matthew the 15th chapter I mean it's something as simple as making it a law for instance that you wash your hands before you eat on the Sabbath day now are they keeping the Sabbath quote unquote keeping the Sabbath yes but when they start making these laws which we don't see in the Bible then it becomes part of their traditions and as Elder said um, earlier that the, the, the commandments of men it was so close to God's law. In other words, the, the commandments of men, when they had the Sabbath, and then you have God who has the Sabbath, they were so similar and so close. But uh, these scribes and Pharisees and, and these religious leaders, they had these little bitty things that they were doing that wasn't law, but they were making it law. And we're going to see that in the book, Elder, of Matthew, the 15th chapter. Teaching, right. the, teaching the doctrine and commandments of men, uh, and here it is, the 15th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 9 show that the Jews judge others based upon the traditions of the elders and not the commandments of El. Therefore, they accuse Yahshua, which is Jesus, of breaking the Sabbath, and he did. But this is important, according to their traditions. Um, if we look in Matthew, the 15th chapter, I'm going to read some of this, Elder, and you can jump in uh, whenever you like. It says, Then came to Yahshua scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, and saying, 
why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? So why do your disciples, why do they go against what the elders establish? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now, this is nowhere in the Bible that you have to wash your hands before they eat bread. But this was a tradition of the elders. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of El by your traditions? So they were going against the commandment of El. How? Because they incorporated their traditions, and their traditions was going against his. For El commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother. He that curses father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of El of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites. Okay. Well, did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. There are people that's not keeping the Sabbath. There are people on the first day of the week, and there are people who say they keep the Sabbath who's keeping it in vain, that they honor El with their lips. It says, this people draweth uh-huh. nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. What makes the people's heart far from El? Are they sincere? Yeah, I think a lot of people are sincere. But it says, but in vain they do worship me, teaching the doctrines, the commandments of men. So, Elder, we now, can we, see that this if, is what turns people just, away from El. If I can just jump back to the first part you read. The scribes and the Pharisees were not the least bit concerned about the commandments of El. They asked the question, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? Right. Now, let's bring that up to date. Somebody come and say, why is it that you keep on going against the, the, uh, the Sunday Sabbath established by the Catholic Church? Oh, you might wonder, well, why did he say that? Well, they established it. Now, th- that wasn't established by El, that you worship him on the first day of the week as the Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with uh, worshiping on the first day of the week. But when you substitute it for the seventh-day Sabbath, you've made a problem. Right. And you have traditions of catechism, or what? Of the Catholics. And the same thing with Presbyterians, with with Jehovah Witnesses and everybody else who has traditions that are not in line with the word of El, and they push them more than they push the word of El. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Jesus broke the Sabbath, but he broke the Sabbath according to man-made laws, not according to the word of El. So the Bible clearly said he broke the Sabbath. I can't argue against that, but I can definitely explain how he broke it. He didn't break the commandments of El. He right. broke with the traditions of men. Right. And that's how we explain that particular verse. And we use the 15th chapter to do it because they were worshiping in vain, and they made the word of none effect. How? By their traditions. Okay, excellent. If the Sabbath, here's a big one, and this is one, probably one of the first ones that people are going to use, Elder. If the Sabbath is binding today. Explain Colossians, the second chapter, uh, verse 14 through 16. Good. And again, I want to caution those of you that's listening. One of the biggest tricks that the enemy will pull on you is to find a verse and isolate it from the rest of the verses in that particular uh, chapter. And this is what they'll do with it. Let's just uh, pull up the verse so we can go straight to it. Okay. Now, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And what did they tell you that was? They said, that's the Sabbath, which was contrary to us. They say, that was the Sabbath, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. They say, well, he nails the Sabbath to the cross. That's and having right. spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. They said, that was the Sabbath. Triumphing over them in it. Then, because of this statement is why they try to justify it was the Sabbath. Let no man, therefore, judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day 
or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And because it mentions Sabbath days and new moon, they say, see, that's what he nailed to the cross. And we fall into the trap because we allow them to read one or two verses in isolation. Right. That's right. Um, and, and we're going to go into some uh, detail, Elder, with Colossians, the second chapter, verse 14 through verse 16 is really uh, talking about. Mm-hmm. Colossians, the second chapter, verse 14 through 16 above that we just read, is often used by individuals to suggest that they should not be judged by others for not keeping the Sabbath. The writer, Apostle Paul, was actually speaking to Sabbath keepers. And if you read through Colossians and read through Paul's writings, Paul kept the Sabbath and the church kept the Sabbath. And we're going to see that in just a minute, warning them not to be charmed by philosophy, by vain deceit by the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, and by other enticing words designed to rob them of their heavenly reward. And we see that today. For those teachings were aimed at encouraging believers to abandon biblical truth and to adopt man-made practices. In this way, Paul, a Sabbath keeper himself, encouraged believers to hold fast their convictions concerning the Sabbath, the new moons, etc. So, uh, Elder... Uh, if you want to break down a little bit of this uh, verse, and we want to show how uh, man has used this to kind of uh, go against the Shabbat, which is the Sabbath. Now, it's sort of like when you're reading the Bible, they put their hand over this part of the verse because they don't want you to look at it. Okay, if you started in Colossians 2 and verse 4, it said, lest any man should beguile you. So somebody's out there trying to trick you by using enticing words. Paul is talking to the saints, those that keep the Sabbath. Don't be tricked. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Well, this is philosophy Paul is talking about. Don't be deceived by philosophy. And the Greeks were great with philosophy and vain deceit. We know what something that's vain is. It's vain. It doesn't accomplish what it's set out to uh, resolve or to do. After the traditions of men. See, they put their finger over that. You weren't supposed to see that Paul is actually right. talking about the traditions of men. Right. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Christ himself kept the Sabbath. So this is saying that they're telling you about everything else but after Christ. Let no man beguile you. Don't be tricked, saints, of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which they have, which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up. Let me just get through. Wherefore, if you be dead with Mashiach, which is Christ, from the rudiments of the world, if you ignore the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? So when you put this in relationship to verses 14 through 16, you'll find out that he's not telling you don't keep the Sabbath. He's encouraging you to hold on to the Sabbath and don't be tricked. So people are taking these, these verses out of context and applying it to themselves, saying, you can't judge me because I don't keep the Sabbath. You will lie and wonder. All right. If the Sabbath is binding today, let's explain Galatians, the fourth chapter, verse 10 to 12, uh, as well as Romans, the 14th chapter, verse uh, 5 and uh, verse 6. And I'll go, go ahead, ahead and read that. You want to read that? Read. Elder? No, okay. you go ahead. Let me read that verse. It says, ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not endured me at all. Now, when we look at Galatians, the fourth chapter, the Apostle Paul is talking to some people he said observes days. And you know what? Guess what? So do we. But we don't observe the same days that these people were observing. Okay? I observe the Sabbath day. I observe the feast days. I observe months. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible told me to observe the beginning of months. I observe times and years. But these people were observing days and months and years that were not the same as what Paul was doing. That's why when you look down here, Paul said, I beseech you, be as I am. Paul kept the Sabbath. Read Acts, the 17th chapter, and verse 2. He did it 
uh, ritually, he continued to do it every Sabbath. And we're going to see how he did it continually. But these people will tell you that this is talking about the Sabbath and you have no business observing the Sabbath and the new moon and all that. And because they know the Bible talks about the new moon, that's where they're going to bring the months in at. And so it's easy to trick people who don't read the Bible, and especially those who don't have the background of the Old Testament. Because remember the Old Testament said, your feast days and your new moons? Well, these people were doing things that were not set up by El. And when you do that, you are not serving with El. And that's why Paul said, I'm afraid of you. Because when you read another verse, it's going to tell you that they went back to the same elements that they had in the beginning. Right. All right. And uh, Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 5 and 6, we're going to talk about this particular verse, Elder, on, on this slide and the next one. Uh, and if I can ask the saints or tell the saints, you mark this one down because this is another one. This is one of the main ones, along with uh, Colossians, that they're going to use. Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 5 and 6. It says, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Jehovah, which is Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth ale thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. And we're going to talk about this, Elder, but um, this is a main Bible verse of people are going to say, see, the Bible says you don't esteem one day above another one. And they're going to say, so you don't have to keep the seven day Sabbath. Look what Romans, the 14th chapter, verse five and six say. And there are people who even call themselves believing in the whole Bible that believe in the Sabbath. And they back away from Paul because they don't understand some of these writings. So we're going to go to the next next slide, Elder, if you want to talk a little bit about it. Um, then, yes. then we can talk about on this slide or or the one after this. Okay, uh, when verses 8 and 9 I read, and, and I suggest that you read them, they show that the weak and the beggarly elements which Paul referred to were the original principles which they had prior to their conversion. Now, we're talking about Galatians now. This in Galatians, Galatians, Paul, mm -hmm. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. This is Galatians, in, right. In, in, in Galatians, Paul was talking to uh, them about those days and months and so forth that they observed. And, uh, but the point that, that the apostle uh, was making is that these same people that he had converted turned around and went back to those same weak and beggarly elements. So this is not talking about the Sabbath because Paul kept the Sabbath. Okay, these people didn't go back to the Sabbath. Paul was giving them the Sabbath in the beginning, and they went back to what they were doing in the first place. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, I'm afraid of you lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. So Paul was not speaking against the Sabbath. We have people who don't have background in the Old Testament trying to explain to you something in the New Testament, don't understand the Old Testament, therefore they have difficulty explaining the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But the idea is the same. We have Jews, we have now Greeks, and we have other people that are spreading their philosophies, spreading their doctrines, and spreading their uh, evil ways, and they're expecting you to fall in line. Okay. So when you read that verse down there, and you can read that in your spare time, you can see that the Apostle Paul is not telling them not to keep the Sabbath. Okay? Right. And that's what we need to get a clear understanding on. Okay. Let's I think talk our about, next slide is talking about, go ahead. Yeah, let's talk about Romans. Say if the Sabbath is binding today, um, explain the seemingly contradicting um, passage concerning the Sabbath. And if you want to, Elder, uh, and we just bring all of it up here, I want to go ahead and talk about this. Um, this is very important. Okay. Now, I want you to, in slow motion, follow what Paul is saying. He said, one man, now you didn't say L, he said one man, esteemeth one day above another. So this man, he got different days, but one of them he esteemed higher. And another man esteemeth every day alike. This man said, all these days are just alike. It don't make any difference. Then the key point is Paul said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, Paul don't have any business telling anybody to be fully persuaded in your own mind when it pertains to the Sabbath or the feast days that El set up. 
But when it comes to what one man esteems, that's a different story. So what in the world is Paul talking about? Paul is talking about days that are optional. Right. Because if you read this, you'll find out that L is satisfied with either way you do it. Right. That's what Paul is saying. You can make up your own mind because it don't matter. Now, we got this visual here, Veterans Day. Some people don't want to acknowledge Veterans Day, and that's your right. Okay? okay. Be fully persuaded in your own mind. Okay? No I might want to acknowledge it. That's my right, and I can be fully persuaded in my own mind. You might be married and have an anniversary, and you might want to get something for your wife. Somebody else might say, oh, that's sin. But Paul said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So Paul is talking about days that are optional, days you can keep and still be saved, days you cannot keep and still be saved. Because guess what? He said down here when it came to eating, one man eating all things, another man eating uh, the herbs. He said that he that eateth, eateth unto ill, and he that doesn't, to ill he eateth not. But guess what? The last part said, and giveth ill thanks. Both of them give ill thanks. So it's optional. These are optional days, and these are optional meats that Paul is talking about. It's not you. talking about it's optional for you to eat pork. I was about to say, I because got you on this, but somebody going to say. Against it. <laughs> somebody going to say they want some pork. See, you can eat whatever you want to eat. And, and you can't go against the Bible and then have optional at the same time. So Good. the commandments of L are not optional. Right, right. And uh, this is something we'll talk about again when we talk about the dietary law. There are meats that we were allowed to eat, and some people are vegetarians. They say, we don't, we're not going to eat meat. Be persuaded in your own mind. Uh, we can eat the things that L allowed us to eat. And so this is what this is talking about, Okay. What was the Apostle Paul actually talking about? Um, and, and we have, uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back here. Romans, the 14th chapter, L, um, Elder. Encouraging uh, neither individual to despise or judge the other, Paul concludes that L has received both of them. So we're going to just probably summarize this because we talked a, a lot about this. Um, if we want to concentrate, I guess, on Romans, the 14th chapter, verse 1 through 4, I'll go ahead and read that. And um, if you want to jump in it says him that is weak in the faith receive ye but not to doubtful disputations for one believeth that he may eat all things another who was weak eateth herbs let not him that either despise him that eateth not and let him which eateth not judge him that eateth for El hath received them and so um, I guess we can just go ahead and skip over this elder because I think you covered this in a uh, great detail and did yes. an excellent job uh, before. Uh, but we just want to leave that up for a few seconds if you want to just say a couple of words before we, we move on from this slide. No, I, 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 let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If you want to be a vegetarian, by all means do so. If you want to eat those meats that, that allows you to eat, that according to the dietary law you gave man to eat, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Okay. Has any other days ever been given from El to replace the seventh day Sabbath? Uh, Elder, now a lot of people say that it was replaced um, throughout the Bible. That is from the book of Genesis through Revelations. The Sabbath day has always been observed by the people of El. Although no other day has ever been chosen to replace the seventh day Sabbath, the enemy has managed to raise a great deal of doubt among believers concerning the importance of Sabbath keeping with respect to eternal life. Okay. We have uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, uh, verse four through eight. I'm going to go ahead and read that elder. It says, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the, on this wise and El did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. Let's jump down to verse 7. It says, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Yashach, which is Jesus, had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. 
So, uh, Elder, you got anything? Now, on? the only thing we we need to understand, yes, we just need to understand that we we need to know how to enter into his rest. Because if you don't enter into his rest, you cannot have that eternal life that he was speaking about uh, in the New Testament in the beginning when we spoke of it. We enter into his rest, and, and that's another uh, another study, but we have to keep all of his laws and statutes and his judgments. And you know what? We don't serve an ill that would give you something to keep that you can't keep. Uh, we have people that want to go in the Bible and, well, there's so many uh, different uh, commandments and there's so many different. Look, first of all, most people don't even know what a commandment is. A commandment is anything that El says you do or you don't do. That's his command. Now, count all those. Now, uh, the average one doesn't know because, they, they, first of all, they're reading the Bible in English, and they don't understand many of the commandments that were in there in the Hebrew that when you translate the Bible, they become vague to you. But the point is that we must enter into his rest. So the uh, only way you're going to do that is to keep the Sabbath. You're not going to do that by coming into observing the first day of the week. But if you do that and don't do the Sabbath, you're wrong, and you cannot enter into his rest. Okay. So So he never chose another day for you to keep the Sabbath. Right. And it's important that in order to enter into his rest, there's a commandment to enter into his rest. You cannot enter into his rest without entering into this day of rest. And that's important. That's what we should take from the right. fourth chapter. No other day has ever been given to replace the Sabbath day. Biblical history shows that El has never appointed another day to replace the eternal Sabbath observance. However, on the other hand, man has attempted to provide a rationale for determining that El actually did give another day. The line of reasoning used by these individuals includes this. This is what you're going to hear. The resurrection of Jesus signaled a change to the first day of the week. You're also going to hear that breaking bread on the first day of the week signaled a change. And uh, finally, you're going to hear that the Lord today is the first day of the week. And I know we're going to, we have about maybe seven or eight more slides. Uh, we ask that you be patient, but it's important that we cover these next seven slides. Elder, these three points are points that people are going to just drive home when you bring up the Sabbath to them. And so we have to make sure that we, okay. we know how to address these. And this is what we're going to see in the next few slides. That's all right. Uh, go ahead, Elder. Well, isn't Sunday the Lord's Day? Let's talk about the Lord's Day and what that is. Well, well, let me just give this really quick. They say, well, uh, Sunday is the Lord's Day. No such verse in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, or in the Apocrypha. Uh, you can look in any of your translations except the one where you put Sunday in there, uh, your own words. I'm not talking about a translation. I'm talking about one of yours that you uh, go in and you want to put your uh, modern words that's not a translation. So people want to say that Sunday is the Lord's Day. First of all, the word Sunday doesn't appear in the Bible. The first day of the week does appear in the Bible. Okay, now, but when you read in the Bible concerning the Lord's Day, this is what you're going to find. Uh, in Isaiah 34 and 8, and there's many verses about the Lord's Day. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. Now, that's what the Lord's Day is, and the year of recompense. So he's going to pay you back for all that evil you did, especially that last saying that Sunday is the Lord's Day. Uh, in Ezekiel 30 and 3. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathens. Why? Because they're going to be destroyed. If you look at Second Peter 3 and 10, he just does a wonderful job. And he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. <clears throat> Excuse me, the earth also and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now, what they're essentially saying to you, and you know, you just bring it up to their face, is that the world is going to end on Sunday. 
<laughs> I mean, if they're going to say anything, that's what they're trying to say to you, even though they don't know that. But they're saying that the Lord's Day is Sunday. In other words, it's transferred from the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, to the first day of the week. And you can't find those words there at all. That is what they call their rationale. And mm -hmm. your rationale is not the word. Right. Uh, and then how people control knowledge. You hear the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day, and you don't see—I mean, you don't see that in the Bible. And so what happens is, if you go on the internet and search the Lord's Day, and it'll bring up a dictionary and says Sunday, and so they keep pressing this phrase, the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day, and then you look it up at any other place on the internet, it's going to tell you that the Lord's Day is Sunday. But as the Elder said, there is right. nowhere in the Bible. That suggests such a thing. Well, but look at look at what it just did. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. The dictionary is going to tell you Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. Guess what? You didn't read that in the Bible. Realize, knucklehead, you read that in the dictionary. <laughs> All right. And when you realize that, <laughs> then you realize you are practicing the traditions of men because it's not in the Bible. Okay. Maybe some people just don't know what the Bible. Ivory is well. They, <laughs> it seems. It seems as such. <laughs> so we have a number of different Bible verses, Elder, uh, that they can actually go to um, to see where we. And they're all see. talking about the Lord's Day. R right. Okay. We're going to move on. You can you go back and, and look at this video. You can pause it <laughs> to get these Bible verses. Is there any validity to the argument that the resurrection was a sign? Of change to Sunday worship. Now, this is, you know, a lot of people say, well, uh, in the New Testament, after the resurrection, we now keep Sunday. What do you say to those people? Well, you got to first understand their argument. Because he rose on the first, and he did, by the way. Yeah, he, he rose did. on the first day of the week. That was a sign that he was changing from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day of the week. You lying dog. <laughs> now, why don't you accept this argument? The Bible tells you that in the book of Luke uh, that they rested according to the Sabbath and that the women prepared spices. Do you know that he even rested in the grave on the Sabbath because he would not rise on the Sabbath day? That's right. Now, so... That's a better argument for you because he kept the Sabbath. And years after he kept the Sabbath, after he died and rose, they kept the Sabbath. Why? According to the commandment. That's right. So stop your lying. Learn what the Bible is and learn what a dictionary is. They're not the same. Okay. All right. Luke 24 and 1. It says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. We see in Mark, the 16th chapter, verse 1 and 2 says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary they, Magdalene, all right. go ahead, mm -hmm. and Mary, the mother of James, and Solomon had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came. So okay. we have three different uh, Bible verses. Elder, go ahead um, if you want to comment on that. No, I think I said enough on it. Okay. And I don't. I don't want to uh, upset too many people. Well, I want them to accept the truth. Tell the truth and shame the devil. That's Is there right. any validity to the argument that breaking of bread of the, on the first day of the week signaled a change from the Sabbath observance? They said the apostles, and they got together and broke bread. Now, even though the apostles broke bread on the first day of the week, the act of breaking bread did not signal a change from Sabbath to the first day of the week. Furthermore, the, the, the apostles, and we're going to see here in just a second, they continued to keep the Sabbath day long after the crucifixion. So now, elder, people go and find one Bible verse, and they want to search out through the Bible verses. You see, the Catholic years ago, they ran into a problem. And they ran into a problem with this Sunday in this first day of the week thing. And so now they try to find any Bible verse that says the first day of the week. And they want to see an activity that happened and said this is why we keep the Sabbath. Because they, they sat at the table and ate. And now they say we keep Sunday as the Sabbath because they ate. And if you as if they didn't eat every day. Well, right. <laughs> so, and if you look throughout the Bible and you read the letters concerning Paul, um, we're going to see here in just a second that a lot of the business 
that Paul conducted, we're going to see that he did it after the Sabbath. And so this is why the Bible refers to them doing certain acts on the first day of the week. We'll see also that uh, when he broke bread on the first day of the week, he taught. His, he, you know, he was with his disciples. And he, was, he wasn't at the synagogue. He wasn't teaching the masses. It was a meeting that he had uh, with his disciples, and they ate, and he taught them. So just because we see an event that took place on the first day of the week, foolish for people to believe that the Sabbath day has now been transferred. And you know what? They want me to believe that garbage. Show me one that say the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day, to, from the Bible, not from the dictionary. The Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week, and I'll believe it. Uh, we have, what, maybe 40 to 50 Bible verses that talk about the Sabbath everlasting perpetual covenants, uh, that Christ kept the Sabbath as was his custom. We see all these things throughout the Bible, but yet they find three or four verses that mention something about the first day of the week, and now they want to institute a transfer of the Sabbath. Um, a, few more Bible, a few more slides, Elder. Um, there is a Bible verse in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, verse 2, which says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as El hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So, again, we see an activity taking place on the first day of the week. Remember what I said earlier, that Paul, as he traveled throughout different cities, throughout different countries, he conducted a lot of business on the first day of the week. Let's just read this real quick, and we're going to see what this first day of the week and the gathering of money meant. Were they collecting an offering? Were they in church service? Let's see. Paul writes to the Corinthians that he has requested money be saved for distribution to the needy saints in Jerusalem. Find that in verse 3. Paul is recommending that each person on the first day of the week lay aside and save by themselves a proportional amount of their income for the purpose of this offering. In that way, when Paul arrives, the necessary funds will be already set aside and available. Upon meeting with Paul after his arrival at Corinth, the money that had been saved up would be given to the designated courier and taken to Jerusalem by Paul's direction. Most notable, Paul is not instructing the Corinthians to observe Sunday or even implying that funds are to be collected at a Sunday worship service. He is saying that on the first day of the week, each person is to allocate and set aside at home a portion of their funds. There is no indication that the individual needed to leave home or go anywhere to do this. So they were, they were not meeting at the synagogue. They were not meeting uh, to have a service. But Paul said, when I come through after the Sabbath, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to collect money for the needy. So it's important, Elder, that we understand um, what this particular Bible verse is saying. Paul preached for 78 Sabbaths in Corinth. Now, remember, some people are going to read uh, the book of Colossians, the second chapter. We remember we read that earlier when they said he nailed the Sabbath to the cross. Now, we had a Bible study on last week, and we showed that El said he was with Paul. He said, fear not. The Bible tells us that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if Paul wasn't keeping all the commands of the Most High, would, the Holy, would he be filled with the Holy Spirit? Would El speak to him and tell him to fear not, I'll be with you? Christ was nailed to the cross somewhere between 33, 34 A.D. Paul died in 67 A.D. So we see some 30 years later, we're going to see that Paul was still keeping the Sabbath day. It's also clear from the book of Acts that Paul kept only the Sabbath day in Corinth and not Sunday. In Acts, the 18th chapter, verse 1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Verse 4 says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, remember, verse 4 says that he did this every Sabbath. In the book of Acts, the 18th chapter, verse 11, it says, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of El among them. This is how we come up with the 78 Sabbaths in Corinth, because the Bible in verse 4 said that he did it every Sabbath. Verse 11 tells us he was there for a year and and six months. That means that in Corinth, he preached the gospel for 78 weeks. 
And we know from Acts, the 17th chapter, verse 2, it says, and Paul, as his manner was. Now, the same, uh, what manner means is custom. It was his custom. He went into them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scripture. So we know that it was a custom of Paul. We can see from Acts, the 17th chapter, and Acts, the 18th chapter, that this was his custom. So how can they come up with the conclusion that Christ nailed it to the cross? And we know custom. It means a habitual practice of a person. So he was a habitual Sabbath keeper elder. And these Bible verses show us that. Paul keeps the Sabbath while preaching in Antioch. In, in Acts uh, chapter 13, Paul arrives in Antioch. And you can see that in, in verse 14. Okay. And on the Sabbath day, he goes to the synagogue to preach. Now, if we look at Acts the 13th chapter, verse 42, it says, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, if they were keeping Sunday, why did the Gentiles, why did they want the, the, the word so bad? They didn't come the next Sunday. They didn't come Sunday. They came the next Sabbath. And Acts 13, 44 says, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of El. So if they were keeping Sunday, why did the whole city come before Paul on the Sabbath day? Don't let people tell you a lie that the Sabbath day was nailed to the cross because we see Paul's custom was to keep the Sabbath day. Elder, if you can answer, what's so special about the Sabbath? We have, uh, I think, one or two more slides. What's so special about the Sabbath day? Okay, I think we might have lost uh, uh, L.D. You can call in. I don't hear you, so if you want to call us in. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, oh, good. I just want to say the Sabbath is a perpetual covenant. You want to live forever? The Sabbath is going to be forever. You can keep the Sabbath forever. You don't want to live forever? Then you can keep the first day of the week. Because the first day of the week, it didn't say that it's going to be from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. Now, uh, it's going to be in the new heaven and the new earth, the Sabbath. That's what's so important about it. You want to go to heaven? That's what they're going to celebrate. You don't like the Sabbath? Don't plan on going. All right. Now, last of all, if thou will be perfect, keep the commandments. Keep the Sabbath. Don't kill, don't steal. When you do those things, all those are part of a unit. So for heaven's sake, why do you think he, that's the only one he attests the word remember? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Go down through the years, he knew you were going to forget it. So okay. that's what makes it important because he attaches a lot of importance to it. Okay. And we have Genesis, the second chapter, verse 3, as well as Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 11, that tell us that the Sabbath day, um, was created for man, and it was sanctified, and it was set aside. That's all right. Judge as guilty based upon the doctrine and commandments of man. The Bible clearly indicates that Yahshua, which is Jesus, and his disciples broke the Sabbath, for they performed acts that were considered unlawful to perform on the Sabbath day, but did they break the commandments of El, or something less significant? Yahshua and his disciples were blameless because they broke, look what we have in red, they broke man-made with the traditions of the elders and not the commandments of El. After all, there is nothing within the Old Testament that condemned their actions. Judge is guilty based upon the doctrines and commandments. Can you see the screen, Elder? Yes, I can. Okay. If you want to go over, I think we have one more slide after this before we conclude. If you want to go over Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 1 uh, through 4. Well, let, me, let, me, let me just sort of sway a little bit from that because we did talk about that. Okay. Uh, Mashiach gave an uh, excellent, what I believe was an excellent answer to the scribes and the Pharisees in the book of Matthew, the 12th chapter. And he said, have you not read? But David, when he was hungry, now, he's given an example of people that were also bothered by the traditions of the Jews. He said, have you not read how, how when he was hungry, he went into uh, the, the house of God, and he ate the shoe bread, which was unlawful for him to eat? Now, see, even David did something unlawful. But 
he let us know that David was blameless. He said, oh, have you uh, read about uh, the priests that profaned the Sabbath? And guess what? They were blameless. So you can break the Sabbath and be blameless as long as you don't break the commandments of hell. Mm-hmm. I can break all the commandments of men that I want. Be blameless. Right. Just don't break the commandments of hell. Okay. Um, the New Testament shows that one of the offenses which the Jews accused Yahshua of violating was healing on the Sabbath. But no Old or New Testament passage prohibits healing on the Sabbath except the tradition of the Jews. Elder, that's important. It's kind of one of the things that we talked about on tonight that okay. um, he says, I'm Lord God of the Sabbath. And basically, how are you going to tell me how to keep the Sabbath day? They were accusing yeah. him of doing certain acts. But where is that in the Old Testament that I can't heal? Where is it in the Old Testament? Mm-hmm. Look, there, are, there are some emergency, what we call emergency elastic clauses in the Bible, and um, I think we have it in here. We're going to show it in just a second. Um, you don't supposed to lift any heavy objects. You don't supposed to do any kind of work on the Sabbath. But there are emergency clauses. If you're driving down the highway on your way to Sabbath service and you get a flat tire, what are you going to sit on the side of the highway until the sun goes down and say, well, I can't do any work? You're going to get out there and you're going to sweat and you're going to change the tire. So there are some things that are uh, required, that, I mean, that we, that we have to do. And um, uh, El, All right. he gave us that leeway when in, in emergencies. And so this is what these few verses are talking about here. We have um, uh, Matthew, the 12th chapter. And, and I'm, and I'm, if I may ahead, just come in. Mm-hmm. No, he then told the Jews themselves, he said, How if on the Sabbath day your ox would have fallen in the ditch, you wouldn't straightway go pull him out? And they knew that they would. And so they were condemned. And this is what the Bible is talking about in Colossians. He made a show of them openly. They were so embarrassed when he got through with them that they left him long in many cases. And in other cases, they wanted him dead. Right. Um, and we were looking at Luke, the 13th chapter. Towards the middle says, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering. So he's basically this is kind of what we're talking about. We said the emergency call. There are things that happen and they were condemning him. You know, today we have people, elder, and some people who are listening may know there are some people who say, uh in in the, in the Jewish community, when I say Jewish, I'm talking about Judaism, they say, Well, you can't drive your car. Because it lights a fire. That's why they have synagogues in the area, in their neighborhood. And you see, when you have a lot of Jews in a concentrated area, you'll see them walking. Go up to Skokie in, in Illinois. You'll see them walking to the temple or to their synagogue because in their tradition, they say, well, you cannot drive your car. They say you, you cannot can't get on the elevator. You can't get on the elevator. They have a Sabbath elevator. And this elevator automatically, from sundown to sundown, it stops at each floor so that you don't have to push a button. So there are different traditions that we see, um, and, and this is what the Bible is per, per, uh, pertaining to when we have these traditions of man. All right. We went about 20 minutes over, but, Elder, we got to the end. <laughs> and we want to thank everybody for being no, that's patient, wonderful. Uh, patient with us. Uh, we want to just see uh, if those people have to go understand, but we want to open up the uh, – up the study, star six on your phone or star six on your keypad. Uh, we want to try to at least answer a couple of questions if we have any. Um, and if not, we're going to just go ahead and continue on and get ready to conclude for uh, tonight. But Elder, it was a beautiful Bible study. Star six on your phone or star I six on your it. keypad. Um, and, and it's important. We have basically the most important, and, and these are the seemingly contradicting uh, Bible verses that people are going to use when they go against the Sabbath. And we, we're trying to get this done in an hour, but we want to eventually have a class where we can teach you how to rebuttal these um, Bible verses and really explain to you in detail what these Bible verses are talking about. We kind of did it, but we did it uh, relatively quick. Um, we encourage you to go through these Bible studies and go through this one again two or three times. And write down the seemingly contradicting Bible verse and listen to what we said the Bible verse actually means and how they've misinterpreted uh, the particular uh, Bible verse. We're going to have uh, this Bible study.
recorded. We're going to have it uploaded uh, sometime tonight. You can go to our YouTube channel or you can go to our, our website at tvbaythel.net and we're going to have it uh, recorded. So you can listen to it as many times as you want. You can download it if, if possible. If you have any questions on this Bible study, we ask that you send those questions to Bible study at Bethel.net. We'll make sure that we answer those questions, um, especially uh, this coming next week. There may be people who look at the Bible study six months, a year, five years from now. Uh, we're going to keep this Bible study um, mailbox open, so in the future you can go ahead and send those questions and we'll, we'll re reply back to them. We also want those uh, individuals who um, are interested in becoming a part of us to uh, go to our website at www.tvbaythel.net, and we want you to become a member uh, from wherever you're at in the country. Uh, we have these Bible studies every Wednesday. We're going to um, set up some things where we're streaming on our closed circuit TV coming up shortly. And um, this is some excellent teaching myself, um, Elder E. Reed, we have Minister Benjamin, we have our um, Minister Nathan Las Vegas and our Chief Apostle. We have a, a number of people who uh, will be participating um, in these teachings. And so we thank, uh, want to thank everybody for coming out, for joining us, for those in Chicago and Minister Nathan Las Vegas. And we have our um, sister in, in, in Nashville and some others in Indiana. We want to thank you all for joining us on tonight. Uh, remember, if you have any questions, make sure you send those to our Bible study at Bayfell.net. And I believe, Elder, we're going to be back here next Wednesday, um, same time, 8 p.m., and we are going to show you how to keep the Sabbath day. Um, yes. Kind of a question that a lot of people know, what are the ordinances or how do I keep the Sabbath day holy? And I believe we may take a week off for um, Feast of Dedication, So, uh, but we'll keep you updated on that. So if there's not any questions, we're going to go ahead and conclude for uh, tonight, and we hope to see you all. Uh, this Sabbath, this Shabbat, we hope to talk to you soon. And uh, if not, we hope to see you on next Wednesday. All right, we hope everybody have a great night. Shalom. All right, shalom.